games being released with crazy bugs only to be fixed later has become a trend in the last decade of gaming, but how exactly did games update before the internet allowed you to easily download patches? Well, a lot of the time, they didn't. If a game had bugs, it just had bugs. The most important part of a game is not the music, not the graphics, not the story, not even the gameplay, it's the deadline. The last thing a game company wants to do is delay their game. You gotta get the game ready by November so kids will have time to ask Santa to get a copy for Christmas. However, back in the early days of gaming, Japanese games would sometimes come out years before their release in other countries. This gave developers time to add in changes in the localized versions. For example, the original Super Mario Bros. was released in Japan on September 13th, 1985, and it was released only a month afterwards in America. However, the European version of the game would not be released for home consoles until a year and a half later on May 15th, 1987. The European version of the game actually has some bug fixes. In the Japanese and American American versions, in every single underwater level in the game, you can clip into the wall above the exit pipe as Big Mario, forcing you to stay trapped there until time runs out and you die. The European version adds a block above the pipe to stop this glitch from happening. Sometimes though, developers wouldn't wait for an international release to update a game, they'd just quietly release an updated version of the game and stop producing copies of the old version. If you were one of the unfortunate saps who bought the janky version 1.0, well, that was just tough luck, you'd have to go out and buy the version 1.1 if you wanted the fixes. One of the most famous examples of this comes from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the N64. The NTSC 1.0 version of Ocarina of Time released in Japan and America had several glitches including one where you could steal the fishing rod item from the fishing minigame by using the hover boots as adult Link to glide over the water and then casting your line while you're hovering. Normally you can't take the rod out of the fishing pond because if you try to leave the area, the fisherman will tell you you can't leave while you have the rod equipped. However, the game doesn't check for this if Link is currently casting his fishing rod, because normally Link can't move while casting. So if you cast your line while using the hover boots to fall in the water, this allows Link to move while technically still being in a state of casting. There is no benefit to having the fishing rod outside of the fishing pond as the game doesn't let you use it, but I mean it's cool I guess. In version 1.1, the hover boots exploit was fixed although doing this glitch still is possible through other means. The 1.2 version of the game features some of the most prominent changes out of all of the versions. Ganondorf's blood was censored, turning it from red to puke green. I was surprised Nintendo even allowed the red blood to begin with given how censor heavy Nintendo games were back then. There was also the Fire Temple song. In the first two versions of the game, the Fire Temple music has Islamic prayers spoken in Arabic. These vocals actually come from a sampling CD filled with vocals meant to be used in music production called Voice Spectral Volume 1 by Best Service. In version 1.2, a different song was used for the Fire Temple. Now, you might think that many of these changes were made to Ocarina of Time after the fact, but strangely, every single version of the N64 Ocarina of Time, even the PAL versions that were released in Europe, were all made before the game first launched in Japan on November 21st, 1998. That begs the question, if Nintendo already had the updated NTSC 1.2 version with all of the bug fixes and censored content, why did they release the outdated version 1.0? Well, one theory is money. It's possible Nintendo had already sent the version 1.0 of the games to a factory to be manufactured. Then shortly after the games were sent off, one of the game devs went back to double check the game and make sure everything was good until they realized, oh shoot, this game's got bugs and oh shoot, we probably shouldn't have blood in the game for kids. So they ended up fixing these issues in the updated versions. Since Nintendo had already sent off the 1.0 cartridges to be made, they would have had to go through with the extremely costly effort of throwing away thousands if not millions of cartridges they had already produced. I'm not sure if Nintendo decided to sell off all of the copies of 1.0 and then start selling the updated versions or if they just released all of them into the wild at once. Like I mentioned, game revisions back then were usually pretty quiet releases, but I guess this would make Ocarina of Time possibly the first game in history to have a day one patch. Ocarina of Time is also pretty interesting as there were plans for an expansion pack for Ocarina of Time called Ura Zelda, which would be released on the floppy disk drive add-on for the N64, the N64DD. This patch was basically 
basically a remix of the base game, increasing the difficulty and adding altered dungeons, kinda like the second quest of the original Zelda. Due to the 64DD's commercial failure, Ura Zelda ended up becoming Ocarina of Time Master Quest for the GameCube, which was initially released as a pre-order bonus for The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker in 2002. If the developers wanted to go the extra mile, they wouldn't just use updates as a way to fix bugs, but also as a way to add new content. I introduce you to the updated re-release, aka the remix. The most iconic remixes are of course the new versions of the Pokemon games. Pokemon Red and Green versions were released on February 27th, 1996 in Japan. About 8 months later, in celebration of the games reaching 1 million copies sold in the October 15th, 1996 issue of Koro Koro Magazine, a new Pokemon game was announced. Pokemon Blue version. Included in each copy of the magazine was an application that Coral Core readers could fill in with their information. Then they could send in the application to have a copy of Pokemon Blue mailed to them. It wouldn't be until three years later when Pokemon Blue was finally made available for regular retail purchase where anyone could go into a game store and buy it. So the game was somewhat exclusive. Pokemon Blue didn't really add a lot of new content, but what it did do was drastically improve the game's visuals. The front sprites of all of the Pokemon were completely redone. Japanese red and green are known for having some, what's the word, uh, bad sprites. So in Pokemon Blue, they ended up getting improved. Blue wasn't the most exciting remix, but fortunately the next version of Gen 1 would set the standard for remixes to come. Pokemon Yellow Version Special Pikachu Edition. This game was released about two years after Pokemon Blue's initial announcement, and it completely changed the game. Giving you Pikachu as a starter Pokemon that could walk behind you, letting you get all three of the original starter Pokemon from Red and Blue, and featuring other references to the Pokemon anime like Jesse and James from Team Rocket. Releasing remixed versions of old games wasn't the only way Pokemon did updates though. Even more often than alternate versions, players got new content through promotional events. Occasionally, Pokemon would be given away in special events run by Nintendo, Koro Koro Magazine, or other collaborating companies. These Pokemon would usually be downloaded by connecting your game cartridge to a special distribution machine, or by connecting your system to a system that had a special distribution cartridge. For a lot of the early promotions, you actually had to send in your cartridge through the mail to get the new Pokemon. I can't imagine there weren't at least a few cartridges that got jacked up in shipping. One of the really interesting early events was a contest where Coral Coral Magazine readers sent in ideas for Pokemon 2, which later became Pokemon Gold and Silver versions. And the best ones would be selected by series creator Satoshi Tajiri and series producer Sunekazu Ishihara. The people who sent in the best ideas would win a surfing Pikachu. Of course, I can't talk about video game updates without talking about Sonic and Knuckles. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was originally going to be one game, but because of a deal Sega like had with McDonald's, they wanted to get a game out by the time the Happy Meal promotion went live. So Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was split into two parts, part A called Sonic 3 and part B called Sonic and Knuckles, both released in 1994. Sonic and Knuckles was a special Sega Genesis cartridge that could lock on to other cartridges, adding new content to those games. If you connected Sonic and Knuckles to Sonic 3, you got the full Sonic the Hedgehog 3 package, called Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Connecting the game to Sonic 2 gave you the ability to play as Knuckles in Sonic 2. Connecting the game to Sonic 1 gave you the greatest Sonic game of all time, Blue Sphere. Connecting it to just about any other Genesis game gave you only one single level of Blue Sphere, which was determined by the data in the game's ROM header, which is basically where general information about a Genesis game is stored, like the game's name and when it was released. Sonic & Knuckles might be the first ever example of DLC-like stuff for a video game. As much as I find old game updates like these amusing and as jank as modern games can be at launch sometimes, it is far more convenient to have the internet to allow for quick and seamless patches. 